exciting stuff. <laughs> exciting to be in person again, right? Yeah. yeah. So, several years ago, um, one of my younger brothers emailed my other three brothers and I and asked if we knew what our cholesterol levels were. It seems that he had just gone to his primary care doctor. His primary care doctor ran some blood work, and his cholesterol was 226. And 226 isn't really that high, but it's a little bit up there, right? And so his doctor said, you know, if it goes up anymore, we might need to put you on some cholesterol medication. And so my brother asked the doctor, he said, well, what would cause my cholesterol to go up? And he got a very generic answer. He said, well, it's either hereditary or it's lifestyle. That didn't really help my brother all that much, right? So it's either hereditary or it's lifestyle. So my brother emails all of us to find out if any of us have high, high cholesterol. I think I might have said blood pressure in the beginning. High cholesterol. He said, find out if any of us have high cholesterol. And he, because basically he wanted to know if it was right in the family, right? It wasn't genetic. So I emailed him back and I said, Joe, this is not a genetic or familial or hereditary issue. This is a lifestyle issue. And as soon as you figure out what's causing your cholesterol level to go up, you can make a change. If you have any questions, let me know. Of course, a year went by, he didn't say a single word, right? But then he has his follow-up physical. And his follow-up physical, now his blood work comes back and his cholesterol level is at 246. So again, it goes from 226 to 246, right? So now it's up there a bit. So he sends out another email. And he asks, hey, just following up on my email from last year, anybody have their <laughs> cholesterol levels checked? And, you know, just wrote a corner for in the family. And I emailed him back again. I said, Joe, it's not hereditary. It's your lifestyle. And then I gave him three things that can cause your cholesterol levels to go up. I said, it might be stress. Stress can cause your cholesterol levels to go up because if we're under stress, our body releases a bunch of stress hormones. And in order to produce those stress hormones, we need LDL, which we call the bad cholesterol, right? And so if we have a lot of stress, we release cortisol and adrenaline and epinephrine and norepinephrine, and the body says, wait, we need more of that stuff. So the liver ramps up the production of LDL for the production of more stress hormones. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. So it made sense to him, too. I also told him the next thing that can cause your cholesterol levels to go up is a lack of exercise. It is really clear, the more you exercise, the higher your HDLs and the lower your LDLs. And so exercise plays a key role into having a healthy level of cholesterol and the right ratios. And I said, but the big one is your diet. It's what you're putting into your body, right? Because if you're putting food into your body that's fueling and healing, that'll keep your cholesterol levels down. But if you're putting food into your body that's inflammatory, what happens is that when you have inflammatory foods, you have inflammation in your body. And when you have inflammation in your body, it's systemic and it's in the arterial walls and it's actually damaging the arterial walls. And so what happens is that your body ramps up the production of LDL because LDL is not the problem, it's the solution. And nobody knows that. LDL is the patch to the damage in the arterial wall. So that's why you end up with high cholesterol when you're damaging the walls of your arteries to save your life. But we're not taught that, are we? We're taught that LDL is bad and we have to lower it at all costs. So I gave him that great explanation. Guess what? He didn't do anything. <laughs> and then another year passed and he calls me. Now he's frantic. Just got my blood work back. It's 270. 226, 246. 270 is his cholesterol level now. Now that's pretty darn high, isn't it? So he says, all right, I know you told me what caused it, what do I need to do, right? And so I told him, I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to basically clean up your diet. I first went through all three of those with him. How's that stress level? He said, I don't really feel like I have that much stress. You know, things are going good, job's going good, finances are good, family's doing well, vacation at the lake every summer, all summer long, right? He's got a good life. So he says, I don't feel like it's a stress. I said, how, how's your exercise routine? He says, we're out there all the time. We're paddling, we're swimming, we're running, we're biking, we, we go to the gym in the winter time. He says, I could always improve it, but I don't feel like that's that, that bad either. I said, all right, then it's probably your diet. He said, tell me about your diet. He says, I feel like my diet's really good too. <laughs> all right, tell me what you mean by that. What did you have for lunch today? What did you have for dinner today? Go to your cabinets right now and open them up and tell me what are the things that you can read the labels on right now, right? And, and, and all of a sudden you start to realize, you know what, living at the lake all summer long, 
it's like a barbecue every day. It's chips, and it's soda, and it's grilled meats, and it's very few vegetables, and it's pizzas that are delivered, right? So I said, all right, so this is what you need to do. I need you to just literally just completely make a 360 on your diet. I want you to just remove all the inflammatory foods. I sent them a list of what's inflammatory, what's not inflammatory. I told them you need to eat mostly fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds, and clean meats, whether it's fish or any others, clean meats. And if you do that for 90 days, I said, I said hold off on taking the cholesterol medication because he'd already gotten the prescription out, right? I said, hold off on taking the prescription medication. I said, do this for 90 days and have your blood drawn again. I said, what I can promise you with 100% certainty is that you'll be healthier. And I believe it's gonna lower your blood pressure, blood cholesterol as, as well. So he does that, 90 days, he's super clean. He goes in, he has his blood work done, it comes back at 190. Wow. He dropped 80 points in three months because of the lifestyle, because of the way he ate. And so that's why we're here tonight, right? Because the food you put into your body needs to fuel you and repair you, or it's inflammatory and it's causing health problems. But here's what else I want you to take away from tonight. My brother knew the truth, but didn't live it. Knowing the truth is no equal to living the truth. You're gonna get some information tonight, but by the time we finish, I want you to write down the one or two things that you're going to do from the information so that it can help improve your health and potentially save your life, right? That's the goal. That's the way, the reason I'm here tonight. I hope that's the reason that you guys are here tonight as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the two concepts around nutrition that I think are vital for you to filter every decision you make around your food. And the first one is that we need to move from toxicity to purity, right? The food that we put into our body it's for two purposes, fuel or cellular repair. If you put something into your body that's not for fuel or cellular repair, it's gonna to be toxic. Your body has to figure out how to neutralize it or get rid of it, okay? So what are the two things? Fuel or cellular repair, right? That's what I want you to think about. And then the second is that we need to move from deficiency to sufficiency. The food that you put into your body has to be sufficient in all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that it needs for you to run and be healthy. So I want you to think of this like you guys, you guys have a race car. And if you have a race car, it's going to take high octane fuel, right? But if you decide, yeah, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. I think I'll put regular on lead in it. Is it going to run at its peak performance? No. Now what if that fuel is tainted? What if somebody puts sugar in the tank? Oh, this is sugar-free week. I don't know how I can. <laughs> what if somebody, in other words, it's only a matter of time before that car starts to malfunction, right? And then you're going to start replacing parts. You know what that's called in the human body? Drugs and surgery, right? If you're putting stuff into your body that's not supposed to be there and you're moving away from health, you're moving towards drugs and surgery, right? And so we need to move from deficiency to sufficiency. And then we're gonna to finish tonight's workshop by talking about the role that the nervous system plays in your, the digestive process. Because it is your nervous system that's controlling the digestive process, we're gonna take a deep dive into that as well. So let's start out by looking at toxicity to purity. And so when we talk about toxicity to purity, the first thing we need to realize is that there's a vast difference between processed foods, refined foods, and whole foods. And I know that for some of you, this is a super basic concept but I do not want to gloss over this because it's too important, right? So what is the difference in, between processed foods, refined foods, and whole foods? So a whole food, everybody should know. It's a fresh, natural food, as close to its natural state as possible, right? If there was an ingredients label on it, it would just describe the product. It's an apple, asparagus, cashews, salmon, right? That's all you'd read if it had a label on it. Now, the difference between a processed food, or a, I'm sorry, a refined food and a whole food, though, is that a whole food starts out, a processed food starts out as a whole food. Come on in, right? One of those two seats right there. Squeeze out in there, Robert. So a processed food actually starts out as a whole food. So they take the whole food, they break it down as component parts, and then they just use a portion of it to make their product. So instead of apple, it's apple juice. Instead of whole wheat, it's wheat bread, right? Does that make sense? So we've taken the whole, the, the whole food, we've broken it down, and we just use a portion of it for our product. Now the problem with the refining process is it strips a lot of the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients out of it. So if you're ever looking at a packaging, 
and it says fortified with, that means we already took a bunch of stuff out. And so we had to put stuff back in to make it healthier, right? So fortified with for me is a red flag that I'll never even put that in my grocery cart as soon as I see fortified with, right? So that's the problem with refined foods is that you are going to miss some of the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that, again, are necessary to run your body as a high-performance machine. Now, processed foods, again, starts out as a whole food. So we have the whole food. We break it down as component parts. We use a portion of that to make our product, but now we have additives and preservatives to extend the shelf life, right? So instead of an apple or apple juice, we have an apple fritter. <laughs> instead of whole wheat bread or wheat bread, we might even have white bread. And not that wheat bread can't be processed, by the way, but what I'm saying is that we're going farther and farther from its original source, right? And when it comes to processed foods, there's over 5,000 additives and preservatives that we can put in our food in the United States, 5,000, right? And of those 5,000 additives and preservatives that we're allowed to put in our food in the United States, only one-third are known to be safe. One-third are generally regarded as safe, and one-third have never been tested. We have no idea what they do to the human body. I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm certain they're not all good, right? So now, I also want you to pay attention to labels and, and packaging because the food manufacturers, the food scientists, and the people who market the food are masters of deception, in my opinion. And so when I look at certain products, and I just use Nature Valley Crunch and Granola Bars just as an example, most people, if, they, if they've never looked at any of the nutritional uh, information, they would think that this is a healthy product, right? And I kind of make a joke at it because I say, yeah, well, it must be healthy because even in the name, it's Nature Valley. So it was found in nature and grown in the valley. <laughs> That's not what that means. <laughs> but when you start to look at the ingredients, you're going to quickly realize there is nothing healthy about Nature Valley granola bars. So it starts out with whole grain oats. Now that's a carb. And so when you put a carb into your body, what does it break down to? Sugar. Sugars, right? Everybody knows that carbs in your body break down to sugars, right? And so it spikes your insulin level. So that's the first ingredient is whole grain oats. Then it has sugar as its second ingredient. Then it has canola oil. Anybody familiar with canola oil? Does anybody know what canola oil stands for? Canola oil stands for Canadian oil low acidity. It's made from the rapeseed, one of the, one of the worst oils. You talk about a, a, an absolutely inflammatory oil, and it's in everything, and it's everywhere. And it is a low quality, high acidity. And it says low acidity, I'm sorry, high, high infl inflammatory oil. I wouldn't recommend it in any product that I ever had. So, so now we have the, one of the cheapest and uh, worst oils that you can put in it. Yellow corn flour, what's that gonna break down into? Sugar. 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 Honey. Sugar. Sugar. Soy flour, what's that gonna break down into? Sugar. Sugar. Brown sugar syrup. Oh, sugar. Right? Salt, soy lecithin, baking soda, natural flavors, whatever that is, yeah. right? Natural <laughs> flavors. So of the first six ingredients, three of them are sugar, three of them break down to sugar, right? So is that a health product? No. no, but everybody thinks that it is. It's granola, right? Mm -hmm. It's not healthy. So we need to start looking at the labels. Or, as Dr. Joel Furman says, I love Dr. Joel Furman. He's a medical doctor. He's looked at health and diet from every angle that you can imagine. He's written multiple books, including Cholesterol Protection for Life, which you eat to live at the end of diabetes. And I love what he says about labels. He says the most important thing to remember about food labels is to avoid foods that have labels. <laughs> it's the, best, the smartest thing that you can do, right? There's another author out there by the name of Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan wrote a book called Food Rules. And Food Rules is a super small, very easy book to read, right? It's that big. And it's 64 rules around eating food. And so what he does is that he lists the rule and then he gives you an explanation of what he meant by that rule. And again, some of them start out so basic, but when you read it, they're quite profound. Rule number one, eat food. It's <laughs> a pretty basic rule, isn't it? But here's what he says. These days, this is easier said than done, especially when 17,000 new products show up in the supermarket each year, all vying for your food dollar. 
but most of these items don't deserve to be called food. I call them edible food-like substances. They're highly processed concoctions designed by food scientists consisting mostly of ingredients derived from corn and soy that no normal person keeps in their pantry. And they contain chemical additives with which the human body has not been long acquainted. Today, much of the challenge of eating well comes down to choosing real food and avoiding these industrial novelties. Eat food, right? So that's what he's saying. And it's a really cool little book because every single 64 rules, all with just about a paragraph and an explanation, and it really helps you dig, dig deep into the meaning behind what he says with there. So we need to move again from toxicity to purity. The way we do that again is that we reduce our, we should be eliminating our processed foods, reducing our refined foods, and eating primarily whole foods. But are all whole foods safe? Why are they not safe? I, I heard the answer. In this. Yeah. Pesticides, herbicides, non-organic, right? So yes, so that's absolutely true. We have pesticides on our food. And again, a lot of them are really toxic. Some of them are uh, endocrine disruptors. Some of them are uh, neurological disruptors. I mean, there's a lot of issues with a lot of the pesticides. I, did anybody see 60 Minutes on Sunday? Did you see that the, there's a group of farmers suing one of the pesticide companies? They're in their 40s and 50s and they're all shaking like they have Parkinson's, mm -hmm. right? And there's and not, not a few. We're talking about 700, I think is the number that I remember. Wow. 700 farmers all in that age bracket, all using the same stuff, all, all shaking like they have Parkinson's, right? And it's because of the pesticides that they've been using. So when I say we shouldn't, we shouldn't be eating foods with pesticides, I mean, I get the fact that it's more expensive. But it's not only better for you and your family, it's literally better for the environment and the people that are growing it, right? So now, what is the number one complaint about organic food? Cost. cost, without a doubt, right? The cost of organic food is 30, 40, 50, sometimes even double the price of regular produce, right? So sometimes we need to decide what we're gonna buy organically and what we're not. Is anybody familiar with the Environmental Working Group, EWG? Yes. Yes. Environmental Working Group, you can go online, it's ewg.org, right? So you go to the Environmental Working Group and they list all the different products and then they rate them on a scale of zero or one to 10. One, two, and three is green, that's really good. Very little issues, no toxicity. Once you get up to the eight, nines, and tens, that is absolutely garbage food, right? And so and I'm just gonna make a guess, I did not look this up, but if you want to, you can tell me if I'm true. Things like uh, Axe deodorant. Mm -hmm. Right? That would probably be on the upper right-hand side of that scale. How about uh, monster drinks? <laughs> They're probably on the far side of that scale, right? But you can go up and look up at household products. You can look up food and what's more likely to have pesticides, what's, what's less likely. And then every year they put out what they call the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. The Dirty Dozen, this is the group of fruits and vegetables that are either going to have more sprayed on them or they're going to soak more of it in. And so they say, this is the group that you want to buy more organic. And you have this, right? So everybody's got this, your top sheet. And in the clean 15, this is the group where even when they spray it, we don't get as much in us because typically there's a coating or there's something that's protecting it. So in other words, strawberries are gonna absorb quite a bit. Apples, they spray a ton on it and we still eat the peel. We still eat the outside, right? But when's the last time you ate an avocado or a pineapple corn <laughs> outside? Right? We don't eat those things. And so when they spray it, at least it's not getting on the inside as much, and so we're not gonna get a, as many. So if you're gonna go to organic, go organic here, right? And not don't worry about it as much here. But again, what you'll do is you'll start to move away from toxicity and towards purity, right? And that's the goal. Next, we wanna move from deficiency to sufficiency. But how do you know if you're deficient, right? Well, there's a bunch of indicators, and then there's one confirmation. So the first indicator is, do you have a diagnosed condition? A couple hundred years ago, if you were a sailor, you'd go out to sea, and if you stayed out there for several months, and you didn't have any citrus fruit, you'd end up with bleeding gums, teeth falling out, eyes sunk, sunk back in, hair getting thin, and brittle nails. And they would diagnose you with a condition called scurvy. But they noticed that the sailors that went out with crates of oranges and lemons and limes, they didn't get that. So if you were a sailor 200 years ago and you ended up going out to sea for a long period of time and got scurvy, what do you think you were deficient in? Vitamin C. Vitamin C, exactly right, vitamin C. Now, rickets hasn't been around very much in this country for a long, long, long time. 
But in third world countries with great poverty, you still see it. And you see it in the pictures when they show it on TV with the child who's had some bull legs, right? And they have brittle bones. So if you're diagnosed with brick, uh, rickets, what are you deficient in? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. Now, we don't have scurvy and rickets around too much in this country, but we do have a lot of anemia. If you have anemia, what are you deficient in? Iron. Iron, Iron right? That's, and that's the most common anemia, but there's multiple different types of anemias. And one of them is actually literally called iron deficiency anemia. So that one's easy. If you have iron deficiency anemia, you're deficient in iron, right? But you might also be deficient in B12 or something else that's building those red blood cells. So you need to be aware of what type of anemia you have. Alzheimer's. Most people don't know this one. What are you deficient in if, you have, if you're developing Alzheimer's? Magnesium. Magnesium. That is exactly right. Magnesium. And so I was listening to uh, really just a, a, a brilliant professor at a university at a, at a continuing ed seminar about a month ago. And he said, there's two really good ways to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. One of them is a guarantee. And one of them just decreases your odds. So he said, which one do you think you should do? The one that's a guarantee, right? He says, but I don't recommend that because, that because the only way to completely avoid that is to die early. <laughs> but he does recommend magnesium because if you're low on magnesium, you're literally losing brain cells at an unacceptable rate. And then some of those brain cells will be your memory brain cells. Right? And so then eventually you start developing Alzheimer's. So you want to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's, you take magnesium. And that will offset it, and that will help you move from deficiency to sufficiency. And the last one I'm going to talk about here is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a loss of bone density. And so this is actually an x-ray that I took. Notice the date on this. This was done not even two weeks ago. T you know, tomorrow will be two weeks, right? This is an x-ray that I took two weeks ago. This is a low back of a 75-year-old who took a fall, landed on his bum. For the next several weeks, he had unbearable low back pain, barely could get out of bed. Now it's down to a kind of this, I won't even say mild, moderate grade kind of annoyance, low back, gnawing pain. And it's been there now for a total of six weeks when he came in. So I took this x-ray, so if you guys can kind of make this out, that's the sacrum, right? So if you're sitting, you're sitting right here, right now. There's five lumbar vertebrae. Each of those vertebrae should be nice and square. As you look at this one, that's square, this one, that's square, this one, that's square. How about that one? Can you make out a square bone there? No. What happened was he has osteoporosis. His bones are weaker. He takes a fall, which normally would not have been a problem, but because his bones are weaker, that's a compression fracture. It literally crushed that vertebra. So when I showed him, I took that x-ray, and I, we didn't even have him come back in the next day. I literally showed him the x-ray right away. I said, this is the reason that you're having your back pain. That's not a chiropractic issue. So I sent him back to his primary care doctor. He had some other things going on as well. But the reason that we can see osteoporosis on this is, can you guys tell that the edge of this is whiter and it's definitely darker in the middle? So that's what it looks like on x-ray. But here's what's really important to note. You have to lose 30 to 50% of your bone mass before it will ever show up on an x-ray, which is why we have bone scans. Bone scans can pick it up at two, three, 5% loss, right? So we want to detect it as early as we can. But the other problem with detecting it early is what is the medical profession going to do if you have osteoporosis? Pills. Give you calcium. I heard pills. What else? What, are they, what supplement are they going to recommend? Calcium. Calcium. And, and hopefully magnesium as well, right? Because most people think of when osteoporosis, they think calcium because the bone is primarily made up of calcium, or at least that's the most prevalent nutrient or mineral in there. But there's almost 20 minerals in your bone. Magnesium is number two, by the way, just to let you know that. So if we're putting calcium into the system, but we're not balancing it out, we throw our blood chemistry off, right? So we've got too much calcium in the system and not enough of those others. And what they discovered after studying this stuff for decades is that you can take calcium for years and it does not go into your bone. And it does not reduce your risk of hip fracture. It's the same level, but you know what it does? it increases your rate of heart attack. You know why? Because calcium is a muscle contractor. It sustains muscle contraction. And if you have a large amount of calcium in your blood, your body says, we need to get some of that out of the blood. It puts it in the tissues. 
and when you put it into the heart tissue, it seizes it. It literally stops your heart. So if you're taking calcium by itself, you need to stop. And I'm going to give you some recommendations. Right? So what do you do? Well, first of all, you need to know the cofactors to get in calcium to get all the way into your bones. And the first cofactor is you need strong stomach acid. Now, the reason that you need strong stomach acid is because, let's say I take a bite of broccoli. Broccoli's got a lot of really good calcium in it. But if my stomach acid isn't strong enough, I don't break it down enough, that calcium is not bioavailable. So you're not going to get it any, anywhere past that. It's going to stay in your GI system. So you need a strong stomach acid. GI, the stomach acid should be somewhere around two, maybe at the most three. Which, by the way, to give you an idea, it's just better than battery acid. Right? So that's how acidic your stomach is. It literally is that acidic, right? Mm -hmm. So, and by the way, soda, if you're drinking soda, you're right in that area right there. Acid rain, soda is worse than acid rain. More acidic than acid rain. Isn't that amazing? So, so we, need, we need to have the stomach acid somewhere around two at the most three to break down our food so that our calcium and all the other minerals are available for absorption. So now the stomach breaks it down and now it's gonna move into the small intestines, right? So food comes in, goes in the stomach, stomach breaks it down. Once it's primarily liquid form, it goes in the small intestines. In the small intestines, you need vitamin D3 to transport the calcium and a lot of the other minerals across the cell wall to get into the bloodstream. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you're not gonna transport enough of it across the cell wall to get the calcium into the blood in the first place. Now, once the calcium is in the blood and all those other nutrients, it's going to be flowing through your body, right? And it's going to come near the tissues that need it. And so now we need omega-3 essential fatty acids. That's going to transport it from the blood across the cell wall into the cells, tissues, and organs. Now you finally need vitamin K. Vitamin K is what transports it into the bones and magnesium, by the way. So both of those two help transport it into the bones. And so if you take just calcium, you're missing all the cofactors that it takes to actually get it all the way to the bones, right? And then finally, you need weight-bearing exercises. Now, why would you need weight-bearing exercise? The body's really smart. We talk about that a lot in our office, right? Your body's really smart. It does everything for a reason. And so your body says, where do I need the calcium? If you're exercising, you're putting stress against the bone, the brain says, we need the bone stronger. So now it's going to help deposit the calcium into the bone instead of keeping it in the, in the soft tissue or in the blood supply, right? So that's why you need weight-bearing exercise plus all the cofactors. Second way you move from deficiency to sufficiency is you look for signs and symptoms. I believe this is your second sheet. Yes, it is. And so if you read through that, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but if, but if you have, so if you read through some of this, if you have pale lower eyelids, iron deficiency. If you have bleeding gums, vitamin C. If you have, um, let's see, nails, if you have spoon-shaped nails, iron and vitamin B12, right? So your body gives you all these different clues, but sometimes we don't know what the clue means. So that will help you out. But you can also Google it, but also remember, Dr. Google can be very dangerous, right? We can get a, we, everybody's going to die within the next two days if, if you read too much on Google, right? So that's the problem with, with looking at those things up. But if you have any questions, you can let me know. The next thing is you can do to determine if you have any deficiencies is look at the medications that you're taking. Some medications literally rob or gobble up your vitamins and minerals. And there's a list of, and this comes from the physician desk reference, by the way. So this is a legitimate source that says, if you take these medications, this is what you're going to be depleted in, right? So if you take an antacid, and then they give you the name brands of some of the antacids, you're going to be deficient in vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and zinc. Why would that be? Well, if you don't have the stomach acid, you're not going to break it down. If you can't break it down, it's not absorbable, it's not available, right? And so this is one of the reasons that I... That I and in the last way, again, the first three, these are the indications. The last one is the confirmation. It's your blood work. And I believe that it's a really good idea to have blood work on a regular basis. I mean, when you're younger, you probably don't need it as much. But by the time you hit 40 years old and older, you should be getting your blood drawn every year so that you can see if you're deficient on anything, right? Because these can give you indicators. This is the confirmation. And the three most common deficiencies are magnesium, omega-3s, and vitamin D, right? The reason magnesium, we're so low on magnesium as a general rule, is because if you talk to a farmer and you say, what does the fertilizer do when they put it on the soil? Well, it does this, this, and this. 
But does it bind to the magnesium? Yes, it does. So the fertilizer binds to the magnesium and leaves the magnesium in the soil. So we're not getting it in our plants the way we're supposed to. So we're deficient in the food that we eat automatically because of how much fertilizer we've been using, right? When it comes to omega-3s, we don't eat enough fish, avocados, beans, nuts, and seeds, right? So how many of you eat fish three times a week? A couple people. That's really good. Really good. And if, and if I were to guess, if, if I had 100 people that I just got from the mall and asked them that same question, and there's maybe 25 people in here, right? If I asked 100 people in the mall that same question, we'd probably have the same number. In other words, not, people are not eating enough fish, avocados, beans, nuts, and seeds, which is where you're going to get your omega-3s, right? So that's the reason that, that so many of us are deficient in that. And then vitamin D. What's the best source of vitamin D? Sun. sun. The sun. Everybody knows it, but everybody's told to stay out of the sun. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Yeah. Where do you get vitamin D? The sun. Should you go to the sun? Oh no, don't go in the sun. <laughs> but it's even harder to get enough sun here in New England because we have these long winters, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you go out in the sun, and I've read this from a lot of authors, as a general rule, you want 15 or 20 minutes. You should never be getting burnt, by the way, because if you're getting burnt, you're getting down to the deeper layers, and now you can start to develop that cancer that they're worried about. But if you're out there for 15 to 20 minutes in a t-shirt and shorts, you can get enough sun on a daily basis. But again, we live in New England, right? And the problem is, is that if you live above the 35th parallel, there's four to five months out of the year that you can't get enough sun. Right? That's the 35th parallel. That's below the midpoint of the United States. Right? Where are we? This is where the 35th is. We're here. Right? How many of you are in shorts, besides Lisa who goes to Florida, how many of you are in shorts and t-shirts in October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and maybe May? Right? We're literally deficient in sunlight vitamin D eight months out of the year, right? The other way you can get is your food, but there's not a lot of foods that are high content vitamin D, right? So that's really difficult to get it. So that's the one that you should supplement for sure. <laughs> Everybody should be supplementing vitamin D. And here's, oh, this is one yeah. guy that does get vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only guy I know. All right, so what, so that, then again, what do we, and what should you supplement, by the way? So, if, it, and, and I am not a big I'm advocate of taking tons of vitamins, just to let you know that right up front. I've never done it my entire life. I truly believe that we should get it, most of the nutrition from the food that we eat. But it, check your blood work, and by the way, when's the best time to check your blood work? Right, right now. Right now. You know why? Because you're as low as you're going to get on vitamin D. You're going to find out how low you are. Right? right? If you check it at the end of the summer, it might be close to those normal ranges. And you're like, hey, my vitamin D is okay. And then you don't do anything for the next year, and you're low six, eight months out of the year. Right? So this is the best time to check those levels. But if you are deficient, you're going you're gonna to want to supplement if you're truly deficient. If you're just borderline, you can get it in the food that you eat. But if you're deficient, there's no way that you can eat enough spinach. Trust me. You can't eat enough spinach to get enough iron to reverse that anemia because you're already too low. So that's when you take iron. If you're deficient in magnesium, 300 to 600 milligrams a day. Omega-3s, 3,000 milligrams a day. Vitamin D, 5,000 milligrams a day. That's what you need to supplement to get it up there. You can't just take the RDA because the RDA won't get you up. It will basically keep you right, or maybe it'll raise a little bit, but if you're really low, it's never gonna get you into that normal range. You have to increase it by quite a bit. And then again, you wanna check it six months. If you're gonna do that, you wanna check it six months later because you don't want too much vitamin D. Right? This seminar that I was at just recently, uh, somebody raised their hand and asked the guy, is vitamin D level 175 too high? Yes. Yikes. Vitamin D above 50 is really good. 60 and 70 is unbelievable. She had a daughter with a vitamin D level 175 that is toxic. You need to make sure that you're paying attention. So if you're going to supplement, you then recheck so that you know what your levels are. Right? And it can take you a year to get back up to speed, by the way, but you don't want to wait a year to get checked. All right, so let's look at the nervous system's role in the digestive process. And the first thing we need to realize is that the nervous system controls and coordinates every function of your body, including the digestive system. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. But let me give you some specific examples. The moment you see food and smell food, 
your brain perceives that, right? It's the olfactory nerve and the optic nerve transmitting information to your brain. Without the olfactory nerve or the optic nerve, your brain does not know there's food in front of you. Agreed? Right? So you smell it and you see it. Then your brain says, that smells good. And that looks good. And then you gain weight. And then it says, yes. And then it sends information. Then it literally sends electrical messages to your salivary glands to, to salivate, right? To produce saliva. Why do we produce saliva? So that we can start the digestive process controlled by the brain. Now, you start chewing the muscles of mastication. Those muscles cannot contract and relax without the brain telling them to do that. The food goes from your mouth down to your esophagus. There's a rhythmic contraction to get the food from your mouth into your stomach. That rhythmic contraction, those smooth muscles, are supplied by the nerves off the spinal cord, which come from the brain. The food in your stomach is telling your brain it's filling up, and then your brain tells the stomach to produce more acid. The food, once it's broken down, goes from the stomach to the small intestines. Again, a nice rhythmic contraction moving the food through. All done by the brain and the nervous system. And then eventually the food that's not taken out of the small intestines and goes in large intestines, and there's some more things that happen there too, but that food's eventually going to get eliminated, right? But even the ability to hold your poop is under the control of your nervous system, right? Everything is under the control of your nervous system. And as long as the messages get from your brain to your body at 100%, it gives your body the potential to function at 100%, and the nervous system will control the digestive system, and you'll get the most from your food. But if you're interfering with the nerves in this region of your spine, upper GI issues. So if I irritate the nerves of my stomach, it's reflux and indigestion and heartburn. This area down here, this is the lower GI system. Poor nerve flow to the lower GI system and it's lower GI issues, constipation, colitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. Now I'm going to sneeze, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I sneeze once, this is going to be a miracle. And I love this quote, and it's, it comes right out of this book called The Textbook of Medical Physiology. And so this is by Guyton, and Guyton writes this textbook. Obviously, there's lots of authors that went into this book, but this was the book that we studied on how the body works when I was in chiropractic college 30 years ago, right? But it's not a chiropractic text. This actually is a medical text for medical doctors used in every medical school in the United States at some point in time for over 30 years. If you read this, it will blow your mind at the details that are in this book. But this is one of the quotes that I took out of the book. Strong stimulation or irritation of the sympathetic nervous system can totally block movement of food through the gastrointestinal tract. These nerves originate in the spinal cord between T8 and L2, this area right here. So basically what it's saying is that if you irritate those nerves enough, you'll shut down food. Can't move through. And I want to share one story with you on this one. This is really cool. This is an x-ray of an 11-year-old female taken in January of this year, three months ago, a little over three months ago. So three months ago, this 11-year-old and her dad comes in. She has constipation for six years. Now, she's only 11, so, which means that it started at five. Wow. Pediatrician, medication. Specialist, medication. Suppositories. Now, you're 11 years old and you're taking medications and doing suppositories. That's kind of sad, right? But they didn't have any other choice. They didn't know what to do. But somehow, she decided, the dad decides to bring the child in to see us. And I went through the exam and I took this x-ray. Pelvis should be level, spine should go straight up and down. We can see how the spine is misaligned, right? Shifting towards the left and then back towards the right. Left here, right there, right there. Nervous system to the lower GI system. Now, if you look at this x-ray, and I know that you, know, you guys might see some x-rays, but not a lot. If you look at this x-ray, see how modeled it is through here? It's gray and dark, and it's kind of swirly and everything, and over here is the same thing, and down into here is the whole same thing? That's all poop. This girl is 11 years old, and she's literally full from every aspect of her lower GI system, her colon, her intestines, everything. So I showed the, the, the daughter and the dad this x-ray. I explained that's what that is, and this right here, this misalignment is going to interfere with the nerves that. And again, I told them, if we get the spine in better alignment, we take the pressure off the nervous system. What I can say with 100% guarantee is your child's going to be healthier. And I believe it's the reason for a constipation. I adjusted her. She went home that night. They came back in the next day for their second adjustment. 
I said, how did you do with your adjustment? She's kind of shy, right, 11 years old. She says, pretty good. And then her dad said, it was the biggest poop I've ever seen. <laughs> Embarrassed the heck out of her. Oh. <laughs> but here's what I want you to know. Three months into care, now she goes through her first progress check. We're asking her how she's doing. And one of my assistants is doing the progress check. She's regular. She's not taking any medication. And she's lost 12 pounds. Oh. And this is not 12 pounds of water. And this is not 12 pounds of fat. This is 12 pounds of poop she lost. That's how backed up she was. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the nervous system controls everything, including the digestive system. So I have a question for you tonight. And if you don't get this right, you're in trouble. <laughs> and I'm even going to give you a hint. I'm going to ask you the question. You can't answer it because we're all going to answer it at the same time until the count of three. It's going to be one, two, three, answer it, okay? Now, there's a term we use to describe a misalignment of the spine. <laughs> it starts with the letter S. <laughs> Nobody say it. I, I, no, I don't I feel like some of you might know this one. The term to describe a misalignment of the spine that causes nerve interference is known as a one, two, three, subluxation. Thank God you got that right. <laughs> really embarrassing for me. A subluxation. And again, a subluxation is a misalignment of the spine that causes nerve interference, right? And so if you're subluxated, it can interfere with your digestive process. It can interfere with all kinds of stuff. And so in wrapping, concepts around nutrition. Number one, move from toxicity to purity. Eliminate processed foods, reduce refined foods, and eat primarily whole foods. The more organic, the better, right? Move from deficiency to sufficiency, making sure that those whole foods are full of nutrients <coughs> and supplementing when necessary, but only when necessary after you've had your blood work done, right? And then finally, get adjusted, keeping your nervous system free of interference. So before we leave, I want you to just take a couple of seconds, and I want you to write down that one thing. Or maybe even you took away two things. Our, and I can give you some examples, right? Moving from toxicity to purity. You're no longer going to shop in the center aisles as much as you are right now, right? Because the whole foods are on the outside and the boxes and cans are in the center. As soon as you get into the aisle, you're now into the, into the toxicity area, right? You might decide, I'm going to add organic bananas or organic, something organic, right? What's going to move you from toxicity to purity? And then again, deficiency to sufficiency. Eating whole foods is automatically going to do it. But maybe you want to have your blood drawn and check your vitamin D levels. By the way, they don't add that automatically. You have to ask for that. And some doctors don't want to add it because then the insurance companies give them a hard time. Right? Because it is an added expense. It's about $80 to run that test. And so the insurance companies are like, now nah, we ran it last time. We'll wait another five years. Yeah, that's good. Five years, I'll be... <laughs> vitamin D deficiency and then of course most of you are getting adjusted so now if you have any questions you can stick around and ask me but I really appreciate you guys being here tonight again every decision you make around your health and around the food that you're putting into your body filter it through that lens and you'll make the right decisions God bless and good night Thank you.